So we're really delighted that Bryony has joined us tonight. Bryony is the Pledge for Nature Coordinator for the North Devon Biosphere. The Pledge for Nature project was launched in January 2020 and is supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. The project aims to galvanise community action to help nature's recovery. Before Pledge for Nature, Bryony was an ecological consultant undertaking a wide variety of species and habitat surveys and also worked in Canada in education and sustainable development and has a BSc in natural sciences. So Bryony, I shall hand over to you. Hello everyone, thank you all for being here. Um, just checking, hopefully you can all see my uh, lovely PowerPoint with a nice meadow in the background. Um, yeah, so thank you Nicola for um, inviting me here today. Um, I recognise a few of you, so um, yeah, nice to see you all. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about what you can do for nature this spring. Um, it fits really well in with the Pledge for Nature project, which um, every three months we have seasonal activities to focus on so over the winter months it's going to be focusing on things like tree planting and and hedge management and now uh, we're talking about the spring activities that you can do so um hopefully it will inspire you to take action i know already some of you are doing so um but yeah the more people that we can spread the word to the better okay so firstly i'm going to do a bit of an introduction to the north devon biosphere um, hopefully you know what the designation is all about, but um, if not, it goes out to the Marine Protected Area of Lundy, down to the Dartmoor National Park, and then out to Exmoor National Park. So it's, it's quite a big area. It's based on the Tor and Torridge River catchment systems. Um, and then it's got the, the A, O and B of, on the coast and the uh, core area, which you can just about see in the yellow, is the Broughton Burrows sand dune system. So that's why our biosphere was designated in the first place, was because of the Broughton Burrows sand dune system. And I'm sure John and Mary Briggs have done excellent talks on them. So I won't go into too much detail, but just to say there are some really special and endemic species um, on the burrows and throughout the biosphere. Um, so it was the first one to be designated in the UK. There are, I think there's six in the UK and 620 worldwide. So it's a designation by UNESCO and it's, it's a, a living laboratory is the idea. So it's meant to be kind of testing out projects um, to see how people and nature can, can work together. So we've had some like really interesting projects. Um, we've had the Landscape and Marine Pioneer working on natural capital. We've had some of the ELMS, the Environmental Land Management, um, farming kind of schemes are trialled here. Um, and we've had the Biocultural Heritage Tourism Project, which uh, Broughton Countryside Centre is doing work with. So, yeah, the Biosphere encompasses a huge range of work. Um, it's quite a small team. So, Andy Bell is the reserve manager, and then we have a few people working um, on the Woods for Water Project and the Tourism Project. Um, but every about well, once or twice a year, a Biosphere Reserve Partnership meets and they discuss everything that's related to the biosphere so marine people council um, research um, and they all discuss the projects and what kind of strategic di directions we want to go in and the pledge for nature project uh, is covered under the nature improvement group and they applied for the lottery funding because they felt like the organizations were doing lots of work but they also needed the community backing behind it so that's why we're trying to encourage um, literally everyone from individuals to communities to farmers to businesses to take action on nature. So what makes our biosphere special, we've got a few um, things on the list. So our calm grasslands, our Devon hedgerows, our, our very cute uh, hazel dormice, um, and then uh, yeah, some endemic species such as the Lundy cabbage, um, Devon white beam, you just don't find anywhere else um, in the country. So. Uh, an interesting, exciting place to live and work, and that's why lots of people visit. However, uh, just like everywhere else in the world, we are facing a biological and climate uh, emergency. Um, hopefully you've all seen, you know, the Attenborough um, uh, documentaries, A Life on Our Planet, he did one on BBC on extinction. Um, and I think it may be as easy when you watch of these things to think, 
it's happening in the Amazon and it's happening elsewhere. But actually, you know, our biosphere is also being degraded. Um, so the State of Nature report in 2019, um, some of the statistics, 15% uh, of species are threatened with extinction, 13% uh, decline in average species abundance. Um, and that was in the last 10 years. So, you know, quite scary figures. Um, and then in the Devon context, one of the best, so one of our problems is that we don't have enough biodiversity data, but one of the best data sets is the Devon Bird Atlas. Um, and that's uh, showing a 54% uh, fall in farmland bird indicators since 1970. So a drop in like skylarks and yellow hammers and you know, to see in the landscape. So yeah, nature needs our help. Uh, you're probably all aware of the ecological crisis, but it's also good to remember that it is on our patch, not just happening elsewhere in the world. The causes of biodiversity decline. Um, so a group from um, the biosphere, uh, uh, they brought together the specialists for the mammal groups, the bird groups, the um, insect groups, and they wanted to discuss what the root causes are in our, in our Northern Devon area in particular. And they did align pretty well with the State of Nature 2019 report. Um, the main ones, intensification and homogenization of farmland, so increased use of uh, fertilizers and pesticides, um, a lack of dynamism we've discussed as, you know, lack, um, removing of hedgerows, a lack of scrub, just having these like neat, uh, you can kind of see in the bottom right, people talk about a, a green desert. Um, and so, yeah, we've seen that more and more since World War II. And now we're hoping with these new um, farming incentives, there'll hopefully be a change in how our farm landscape is. Um, I thought I'd just mention as well, a couple of others. So yeah, climate change. Um, I know we've had some hot weather now. Um, I'm not sure if we can count that down to climate change, but just the extreme changes in weather conditions. So if we have more flooding, if we have more um, droughts, they're gonna affect species. And then there's also the, the effects on phenological synchrony. So when um, species emerge, a butterfly emerges, it might rely on a specific bird being, um, flower being, being out. Um, and so if these timings are mismatched, then that's gonna have a big effect on biodiversity. So <laughs> that's, the, that's the kind of biosphere summary and that's the, the intro to the ecological crisis. So, uh, all on the same page. And now I'm going to talk about the positive things that we can do um, at this time of year um, and what we're going to be promoting through the biosphere between April to June. So the first one is making a nature plan. Um, lots of, well, there's, there's bigger scale plans going on already. So the government is planning a nature recovery network and everywhere in the country is going to have a nature recovery plan with mapped out habitats. Uh, the biosphere has recently been working on a nature recovery plan, but now we're kind of asking, could you make one for your, your village, for your community, or for even just your garden? Um, and this is just great to kind of think of the potential, think of how things link up. Um, and there's lots of advice and lots of people kind of doing this thing already. Um, but yeah, so we've got these, these four steps. Um, so step one, form a nature group. Um, there's already some really great nature groups, um, North Devon Natural History Network, uh, Region Braunton, Sustainable Chumley, uh, Winkley Biodiversity Group, and even um, Barnstable and Bloom and South Moulton and Bloom have got in contact with us asking for advice on how to be more sustainable this year. So there's real potential. Um, but if there isn't a, a group in your area, definitely think about setting one up or um, joining one of these other Facebook groups for knowledge and advice. Um, okay, and then secondly, it's going to be mapping your existing habitats and species. Um, I'm going to go through some of the habitats that you might spot, um, but it's just a good idea to know what you've got. Um, I know the Winkley uh, Environment Group wanted to focus on brimstone butterflies, so we're planting older buckthorn in particular. So it's identifying if you've got any special species in your area that you want to make a change for. Um, and then what could be done? Um, so thinking about the improvements that you could make and where is the right place to plant a tree? Where is the right place to um, improve your verges? That sort of thing. 
And then finally, um, you've got to think about how you're going to do this. Um, and uh, I'll talk about a kind of nature plan challenge fund that the biosphere is running um, later on. Um, so hopefully that could help some people with uh, your budget. And then, yeah, hopefully start taking action. Uh, so some examples of places that have done uh, a wildlife nature plan. Um, so I am originally from Wellington and I actually stumbled across that they are doing a transition town and they've set up a wildlife group and they've put together this quite nice map where they've just had um, sightings submitted by the public on what they've seen in the local area. Um, you could probably contact the record centre for this um, or yeah from your own knowledge of them walking around. Devon Wildlife Trust have got a really good guidance booklet on um, what communities can do for, as part of their Action for Insects campaign. And uh, the kind of part of the way, reason I found out about this kind of nature plan idea was through the Natural Cambridgeshire Toolkit. Um, and they again have um, more detail about uh, each of the habitat types and what you can do in each habitat. So the existing habitats that you might find in your community. Um, gardens and allotments goes without saying, I think they are, can be really, really important. Um, I think I was listening to maybe, was it Professor Golson that said, if you added up all the gardens in the country, they'd be bigger than our national park. So uh, just think of that, you know, amazing amount of area that we could connect if we have really good gardens for pollinators, um, connected for hedgehogs, um, and yeah, having our allotments, maybe pesticide free and things like that. Mature and endemic trees, so that's a picture of a Devon white beam. So um, having these trees that are special to Devon, if you can think about planting them in your area or um, doing some seed swaps, um, I think that definitely is going to be encouraged through our biosphere project. Um, and with Saving Devon's Treescapes, hopefully you've heard about that project through Devon Wildlife Trust. Um, so with our ash dieback, um, we're going to be losing a lot of our, our landscape featured trees. Um, so we've got to think about what we can replace them with um, and yeah, definitely go to um, Devon Ashbrook Dieback Forum if you would like any advice for that. Uh, woodlands, um, I think a few of you went to the Plant Life Rapid Woodland Indicator Assessment talk um, last week. That's really interesting that we have our temperate rainforests with um, key fungi and lichen and mosses that identify our, our woodlands to be special. Um, there's also the Woodland Wildlife Toolkit that if you own a woodland, um, it has some really good advice on management, um, such as coppicing and things like that. Um, the Biosphere does do quite a lot of work on woodlands um, with advice and management and things like that. Um, and yeah, verges. So the Life on the Verge project, which finished um, in 2020, that I did think that identified over 40 special wildlife verges. Um, and Devon County Council on their website have got all the details on how to um, identify which verges are important and how to go about contacting the council um, if you would like to do something about your verges. And then a few extra ones, um, orchards. So this is a picture from the Weir Gifford Orchard um, that I visited, uh, I think it was last year. Um, this was quite an interesting one. Um, so the guy Keith Hughes there, he um, looked at an old tithe map and found that there was an orchard in that location um, many years ago. Um, and there were still two of the old uh, existing orchard trees. He managed to graft them and then uh, corral the community into buying 20 extra trees. Um, and now it's a really lovely space. Orchards, um, one of the best things they're for um, is uh, for pollinators and also for um, wind drop for field fare, um, but also often it's the meadows underneath. If they're man managed as wildflower meadows, they are really important for um, pollinators as well. Rivers, uh, I think the recent environmental agency uh, reports basically show that all of our rivers are in a poor ecological condition. Um, they're not in a good way. So, and that is basically down to land use, but also can be due to, you know, litter and, and um, some like spillage and things like that. The West Country R Rivers Trust are doing um, a citizen science programme where you can take part in river monitoring. And that's quite interesting to find out 
what condition your river is in and then potentially um, I think the West Country Rivers Trust have some good um, programs where they talk to landowners on what they can do better to stop runoff into their local rivers. Hedgerows are a really great feature in our Devon landscape. Um, I don't know if you've seen the video from Rob Bolton, but he uh, is a he's the chair of Devon Hedge Group, and um, he did a study on one of his hedges and found more than two thousand species, which is just incredible. Um, you can think of them, yeah, as growing out with lots of flowers, but then also bare bits of earth can be important for um, bumblebees. So. Um, yeah, a really important connective feature in our landscape. Um, and yeah, look up Devon Hedge Group um, if you want any advice on identifying whether your hedgerow uh, is well managed or what could be improved. Finally, uh, the churches and school grounds. Um, churches uh, can be really great for swifts. Uh, you can install a swift box. Uh, was it Nick? Oh, what's his name? Nick Baker did uh, a swift box video in, in on Facebook um, so I recommend looking that up um, if you can uh, encourage your church warden I think there's over a hundred churches in North Devon so imagine if they all had um, grounds that were wildlife friendly um, and surf boxes and bat boxes and there are a few projects I know going on with churches um, I think there's a living churchyards a week in June so yeah if you are uh, near a local church, try and get them involved. So once you've identified all of your species, it's start to, time to start planning. Um, so I'm trying to bring it back to a local scale to so just what you can do in your garden. So I moved into my place about a year ago. It was very boring. It just had a lawn, a border, a patio. Um, so I was just trying to think of what I could do. Um, and I think one of the main pieces of advice I'd give you is just to have diversity. Um, try and have pollinating um, plants that are going to be flowering all throughout the year. So um, whether it's your bulbs at this time of year, all the way through to um, ivy in the autumn, it's really important to have that diversity uh, so that, um, yeah, any, and night scenting, um, try not to go for the double variety, although if they are one part of your garden, it's not going to be a problem. It's just a bit, if you had double varieties for the whole of your garden, then it wouldn't provide any um, natural pollen for your, your pollinators. Um, and I would look up, yeah, Bumblebee Conservation has a super plants um, guidebook. So if you are wondering when you go to the garden centre what to buy, that's a good place to start. A few other things. Um, so yeah, going pesticide free. Um, again, yeah, Devon Wildlife Trust have some really good materials on, um, you know, having companion planting, having barriers for slugs. Um, I would probably say, yeah, just try and minimise use, try and only use it on the areas that you really, really need to. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a, having a big impact on our insect populations. Um, I think it might have even been Paul who shared uh, an email from the RHS saying, you know, everyone thinks you have to have a, a really wild garden to make, be good for wildlife. And I don't think that's strictly true as well. I think you just, it's good to have some areas that are undisturbed and people don't go into, um, but you can still have the, the nice looking areas as well. Um, so log piles are good just for things to shelter under. Um, hopefully you've seen the solitary bee hotels with the, the bamboo that bees can, um, use and put their nesting uh, leaves in and things. Um, John Walters uh, has done a really good video on making the cob bricks and um, solitary bees love to use them if they're in a sunny spot. Birds, uh, yeah, again, maybe obvious, but trying to keep that feeder topped up. Um, I actually saw a blue tit on the lawn today and our lawn's got moss in it and it's collecting moss for its nest. So maybe having nesting materials. Um, and yeah, I think avian flu is apparently a problem at the moment. So if you can keep your feeder cleaned, you know, once a week, once every few weeks, um, just give it a good scrub and make sure we dry it off. And then hopefully we'll stop the spread of the avian flu. And installing a pond. Uh, so I just got an old washing up bowl 
dug a hole and put that in and already I've got like all snails and I've seen a frog hop by it. Um, frogs apparently like shallow ponds, so lots of little bits of water, especially for those drier months. Um, newts are known for uh, eating, uh, well, predating on tadpoles and um, so they do have a bit of competition, but yeah, definitely try and consider having water in your, in your garden if possible. And finally, a uh, compost heap um, can often find a slow worm hiding in there because of the warmth and obviously it's really good um, to put on your, your plants as well. So those are the main things to your garden. Um, and then there's a few things that if you think on a wider scale, what can I do as a community? So hedgehog highways, uh, having those gaps in the fences so that hedgehogs can move in between. Uh, we've been talking with North Devon Council on how they can be int uh, integrated into new homes as well. Swift and House Martin colonies, again, that's a big project that we've been working on and I'll talk about that uh, in a, shortly. Verges, again, a connective feature throughout your town, throughout your village. And citizen science, I'm not sure, I haven't talked about that too much yet. So um, I know Debbie did a talk on citizen science recently, but I think it's really, really important um, to get these records into the record centre so we can see how our efforts are affecting wildlife. Uh, even the big ones, big butterfly count, the big garden bird watch, they don't take too long and they're easy to take part in, but still really useful um, data. And apparently um, iRecord does um, submit that data to DBRC, so that's a good, good one to use. Um, and if you are in the Torrington and Haverley communities, and there's a conservation communities project that is all about um, recording uh, data, but across Northern Devon, the more data, the better, really. So uh, our second, so that was all about the nature plan. That was our first April to June activity. And this is our second April to June activity. Um, it's all about installing a bird box for Swifts and House Martins. Uh, so Swifts and House Martins, they're going to be coming back. I, I think actually someone said they saw their first swallow in, in Brompton, so it is, maybe it might be an early year, but um, they are, yeah, they should be coming back about the end of April, start of May. So you still have got time um, to put up a Swift box and a House Martin nest cup. Um, they are one of the main ones that um, people find difficult to identify between the three. So Swifts have the notch tail. Swallows have the tailed streamers and house martins have the, the white rump. Um, they're all in decline. Um, BTO, I think, has recently, the British Trust of Ornithology has recently made house martins from an amber status to a, a red status. So again, it means their populations are really suffering. Um, and if you want to find out more about house martins, John Waters is doing a talk next Thursday. Um, again, I'll remind you at the end. Um, so what you can do, um, so there's going to be multiple factors of their decline. Um, lack of nesting sites, so uh, they normally nest in cavities and in houses and old buildings um, and they're kind of losing them. So Swifts, we're, um, the Swift Conservation say you should put a box uh, at least five metres high. Um, they are sometimes a bit tricky to tempt in, so uh, you may have to get a lure, which is a, like a recording. Um, check with the neighbours before you play it, because apparently it's quite loud. Uh, but you can buy them for about £20 um, and then hopefully lure them into your, your nesting box. Um, it's quite good. Devon Birds have been working with communities on installing these and they've tried to work out where they've been nesting in the past to try and boost nest boxes nearby, as that's the most likely way that you're going to um, get them using the boxes. Um, but they're quite easy to make and um, there's a, yeah, a plan that you can um, follow online. Um, and then House Martin's nest cups. Um, so they collect mud and stick it together and then they normally nest under the eaves. Um, I went to, um, Mike Moses had some nesting and he had them between a drone pipe and a thatch. So they like something to rest on maybe. Um, I've done a video on how to make a nest cup where you basically make a kind of cob and then stick it to wood. Um, and again, BTO did a study, um, a citizen science study that showed that uh, you could save them up to 10 days of 
it could take them 10 days to make a nest pup so you could save them that time and that could again help breeding populations um so yeah they're, they're the kind of different types of nest cups and nest boxes um and yeah we definitely encourage you to make your own um but you can buy them on most rspb stop shops and places like that so our third april feeding pledge action it's a very simple one but can have quite a big effect is uh take part in no mo may and again we're going to try and encourage um as many people as possible to take part in this um, it can have really great results. So Plant Life have advised to still cut your lawn every four weeks um, in some areas, and that apparently increases nectar production. So for, um, you know, you might have dandelions, daisies, um, clover, I think I had some self peel. So you can still have quite a good mix, but then it's also good to have these uh, longer length areas um, and that you'll just treat as you would um, maybe a hay meadow and just cut it once at the end of the summer. And then our final fourth uh, April to doing pledge action is to create a wildflower meadow. Um, so wildlife trusts have got a very nice simple um, infographic of how to do it. Uh, so make sure you have the bare soil, that's really important. Um, they don't want to compete with any other grass. Um, if you want to make it uh, spread out easier, you can mix it with some sand, sprinkle it over, give it a bit of water. Um, this time of year should be fine to, to sow your seeds. Um, and then yeah, hopefully in a four to six weeks time, you should have some seedlings popping out. Um, I would say, yeah, there's two main kind of types of wildflower seeds when you're buying them, annuals and perennials. Annuals, are going to, you're going to have these fast flowering, bold colours, um, but next year you're going to have to break it back and make sure the soil is uh, disturbed again. So quite often you see poppies on a field margin edge and that's because the, the soil has been rotated and disturbed again. Perennials are a bit slower to establish, um, but then you just kind of leave them to it and they should be okay. Um, if you have some yellow rattle in there, and um, that's really good as it kind of uh, suppresses the vigorous grasses. Um, but I think you'd have to wait, you'd have to collect it this summer and then sow it next winter because it needs the, the cold to make it work. Um, if you haven't heard of them already, more meadows, they're a dark, more initiated group, but now they're kind of going all over Devon. They've got um, a brilliant forum and they run lots of events. So I'd definitely, um, recommend joining more Mer meadows forum if you have any questions about um, making a wildflower meadow um, I think it's kind of maybe easy in a garden space you just break it a little area but if you are a farmer or a landowner you might need um, some bigger machinery to to uh, scrape back all the grass um, and then obviously you'll have some sort of weed control for docks and thistles and things like that so yeah lots of advice out there um, but uh, can be brilliant results and this picture was from the Gaia Trust, uh, one of their oxide daisy meadows, so brilliant. So, Pledge for Nature. Um, so as Nicola said, um, we started the project in January 2020 and then uh, had a few tree planting events and then there was a pandemic so I definitely haven't seen people in person as much as I would like to but um, we have still had some great successes uh, so we had a uh, orchard project um, where we were able to give some funding to some community projects um, we had three schools we had yeah the National Trust where uh, we had Swimbridge, uh, Lovelcott and Tracy um, Newton Tracy, like they all spread out throughout the biosphere. So that was really great to see. And that was quite often parish councillors um, applying for it and finding the locations and then the uh, councillor budgets uh, contributing to it as well. So um, a really nice project um, with everyone getting involved in. Uh, in terms of pledges, we had over 90 gardens making space for nature, which is a, a great start. Um, and I think we're on about 260 pledges and we're aiming for a thousand pledges 
uh, by the end of the project. So, uh, yeah, please keep spreading the whole word. Um, and then one of the other schemes we ran was a Kestrel nest box. Um, so we had a couple of volunteers make up 30, put a call out on social media and said, if you've got the land and the space to, to put these Kestrel nest boxes, then please do. And we were really uh, yeah, overwhelmed with the response. Um, the BBC ran a little uh, coverage on it. Um, so we definitely could have given away more boxes if we could have. So it might be something that we run again next year. Um, obviously, it's not just about the boxes, it's you know having the rough grassland and not using rodenticides, but it's just having the engagement with the landowners uh, is really important and really good to see. And then, yeah, finally, we had the 2020 Biosphere Nature Awards. Um, again, it was really brilliant to see uh, the efforts that community groups, individuals, um, farmers, schools, um, there was different categories and we gave out awards to them. So yeah, thank you for everyone who took part. We will be running it again for 2021. So all you have to do is um, make your pledge and just write in the description a bit more detail and that will make it easier for us to um, judge it at the end of the year. And then the winners will be announced in January, 2022. So yeah, there's, there's lots of projects going on in the biosphere and sometimes you're not even aware and then you stumble across it. So yeah, that's been really great to see and lots of passionate people. So there's it's lots of uh, doom and gloom around at the moment, but definitely a lot of positive stories. So if you haven't seen it already, this is the pledge map. Um, you can, yeah, add your pledge and uh, it pops up on the map and then you can kind of see what your neighbours are up to as well or encourage them to add a pledge. So finally, um, just some dates and activities to look out for. So I mentioned that the John Walters is going to be doing a talk on House Martins in Devon next Thursday. Um, it's free and um, you can sign up through, um, it's on Facebook, on the Biosphere Facebook. Uh, on Friday, I will be at the Broadland Countryside Centre. Um, I was there last week and then lots of people said they, they missed it. So um, yeah, it'd be nice to be there again. And so I've just got some um, backing wood, some cement, some sawdust um, and some cardboard bowls. And then people can make their own uh, house martin material um house martin s cups um, and it's quite a good easter holiday activity um, and i should have some small packets of wildflower seeds um just a little annual mix for about a two meter patch in your garden uh, if you want to pick up them community nature recovery plan challenge fund um so i did very briefly cover this um but basically we're going to have a challenge fund so that any community across uh, North Devon can apply for a small grant to get their project off the ground. Um, so a project could be, they want to install 20 swift boxes in their community. They've identified the locations and they just need money for the wood or, or they need some wildflower seeds um, from a specialist location or things like that. So yeah, definitely put your um, applications in and then we'll review them in early July to try and give the funding out in mid July. Um, and it's similar to how we run it with the, the orchards uh, scheme last year. Mid-May. Okay, so the Biosphere Nature Recovery Plan, I haven't covered this at all. Um, so the Biosphere... Sorry. <laughs> I haven't spoken this much in a while. Right, right. Um, so <laughs> the Biosphere Nature Recovery Plan. Um, Martin has been doing some great work on this and a few other people in the biosphere, all our partners have been got involved um, and basically we've reviewed everything that's going on in the biosphere, all the projects um, and all the problems I guess and then tried to make an action plan for how the next 5, 10, you know, 20 years are going to play out in the biosphere, what we can do to help nature's recovery. So we've got five action plans, um, coast, woodlands, oh, <laughs> arable, urban, and one other which I've forgotten. But, um, and then there will also be a public facing declaration which everyone can sign up to. Um, so there'll be a consultation on the action plans, but there'll also be this declaration which we really encourage lots of people to sign up to just to show that they are wanting to take part in nature's recovery in the biosphere. Um, and yeah, hopefully it will mean that everyone can get involved in any projects that are going on as well. 
Um, so yeah, that'll be in mid-May, hopefully. <laughs> and then finally, I thought I'd just include this um, More Meadows Verges event, um, as I know lots of communities want to get involved with that, and that's on 14th of April. But yeah, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. And yeah, any questions, let me know. Thank you, Bryony. That was excellent. This, this, considering there's been a lockdown, you've been doing an amazing amount of work and there's a mind boggling amount of information in your presentation. Um, is there some, I suppose it's probably a, a silly question, but is it all, all that kind of info on the Pledge for Nature uh, website so people can find out more information and signposting? Yeah, so on the, if you go to the BISO website, which I hopefully you can see the link at the top of the yeah. page, um, there is a, a knowledge base section. And in the knowledge base, there's like topics. And um, so on a bird box or on a wildflowers on. So, yeah, I would definitely recommend having a little look around the knowledge base and um, seeing which activities to take part in. Fantastic. Do you want to just stop sharing your screen if that's OK? And then we'll go to the grid view and then. See if anyone's got any questions for you. If you like, you can wave at me or use the raise hand function or write in the chat. Well, um, I'll, um, I'll go first, actually. Oh, Martin, Martin was going to ask something, but um, I'll just um, ask if I may, because it, there's, there's quite a lot of information in your talk, but it, if you were just like a uh, you know, have an average garden and want to do something, where would you say is a good place to sort of start? What are the kind of key things that you could do in your garden to really try and make a difference for nature? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say, yeah, having some sort of water would be really good uh, for the birds, for amphibians. Um, obviously, you have to be child safe. It doesn't have to be big. Um, but yeah, just a, a dugout washing up bowl like I did is fine. Um, having a, yeah, the, any wildflowers or just a mixture of flowers, really great. Um, I had a couple of people in Braunton ask me the, a similar question as they had, um, were in a rental place and they were saying, oh, what could we do? And, you know, even you can put wildflowers or any flowers in containers and then if, even if you're not staying there long, you can take them with you. So, yeah, I would say wildflowers, feeding the birds, that's a very simple one. Um, and yeah, having some water source, I think those are the, the top three. <laughs> Great, and it's just simple things that people can do. And like you say, even if you just got things in pots or window boxes, it all makes a difference. And you were saying about, you know, there's all these gardens, if we can connect them all and have all these wildlife corridors, that's obviously gonna make a huge difference for nature. Right, I'll shut up now and then let ask Martin can ask his question. Oh, oh hi, Bryony. <laughs> I've got uh, just two questions. The first one was, I missed the name of the group in Braunton that, that you talked about being a nature group. What's that one? Reading Braunton. What was that? Sorry. Re read. Oh, sorry. Gone up. <laughs> um, sorry, Martin. I'll, I'll um, mention because I'm, I'm a member of that. So it's called Regen Braunton. Okay, right. There's a, there's a Facebook group. So obviously before the pandemic, we were meeting up once a month. Um, but we've only been, I think it, the group's only been sort of doing sporadic things, but before the pandemic we were um, doing things like the tree planting with the biosphere. Um, oh, and, but um, having said that, uh, just to update you actually, there's um, a guy called Adrian Bryant who's a Braunton a parish councillor um, and he's been spearheading a campaign um, to try and uh, introduce beavers onto the cane catchment so um, excitingly we are going to be having a presentation from him in a couple of weeks so I'm just organizing the details of that with him so as soon as I know more I'll be letting everyone know about that but yeah that was just one of the sort of activities that came out from that. Oh brilliant okay and the other one was I've, I've got a I've got a new house and um, I wanted to put some swift boxes up do you think it'd be worth doing it on a on a new house or does it have to be an old historic building like a church or a, something else? No, I think a, a new build is still fine. Um, yeah, as long as you've got the height and ideally have um, the eaves. But yeah. yeah, if you can get one of those lures, um, I think they, they don't tend to find the boxes on their own. So um, if you yeah. can play the calling, you might have to check with your neighbours. But um, <laughs> They're quite amenable. 
what's what's the where do you get hold of the lure is it on uh, on amazon or something like that yeah yeah mike sent me the link to it but I, yeah well, i'll ask mike yeah yeah <laughs> okay lovely thanks good to see you yeah thanks <laughs> Yeah, it, I suppose that's a bit of a problem, actually, because obviously a lot of modern houses and people have refurbished their, their houses and a lot of people have those like plastic fascias now, which is obviously a huge issue, I would have thought. Yeah, well, that's yeah, that's one of the problems that when we've been looking around new houses, but um, some of the newer houses are having swift bricks like already in them. And that's really great to see. Um, but obviously a bit harder to do once they're already built. <laughs> yeah, I think we got we got timber, so we'll be can screw into that. All right. It's okay. <laughs> Perfect. Has anyone else got a question for Bryony? Paul's waving at me. Paul, would you like to ask a question? Yeah. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, as uh, many of you will know, uh, our Devon Wildlife Trust local group, the Basel Area One, traditionally for many years has held a whole series of wildlife walks every Tuesday, even through the summer and occasional cover time as well. Uh, with the pandemic, this didn't happen last summer. And um, it's not going to happen for some time this summer. We, we're looking at how to deal with this. But I'm already getting emails about it. Bryony, you've given me a lot of ideas here to put out to people. I've got to write a big email through MailChimp to all the members. So cross fingers, there will be a lot of people coming forward with pledges and doing other things and doing things as small groups. I think it's small groups at present, isn't it? <laughs> so cross fingers there'll be something happening locally that way that's fantastic paul thank you for that thanks for the ideas brian i'll mute myself well done thanks, and I, I i was going to say i like your idea of the map that you had because that could be something to think about on a local scale if we could do like local sort of town and village interactive maps because we did something similar at the countryside center where people came in and they said if they'd had a hedgehog in their garden but it'd be good if we could make something online and then we can have little pinpoints of where uh, people have seen things so I, I thought that was a great idea so i think mary was waving at me do you want to unmute yourself mary Can you see where to unmute? That's it. Yeah, I've done it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right. Every year, the roads leading into sort of the roundabout, the Barnhenge one, um, you know, that you get covered in sort of bird's foot trefoil, really fantastic. And then next day, you come along and find they've all been mowed. They don't even pick up the cuttings, and there just seems no need whatsoever because. You know, birds foot trefils hardly, and species like that are hardly um, block visibility. And um, it, it's, you know, and they're obviously good food plants for our native butterflies. And it, it's the road, you know, as you go over the new bridge and then um, leading up to there, and then round near the barn henge roundabout itself before that, and either side. Um, and there's a beach, and that could that could be fantastic if they just change their cutting regime, you know, for things like common blue butterflies, and even with all the traffic. Yeah, I would say so. Um, with the biosphere nature cat recovery plan, um, I've been working with the urban group, and that's some uh, representatives from the North Devon Council and the Parks team. Um, oh, so that's been really good to like chat with them. Um, they said they're having a big review of all their kind of contracts over the, the next yeah. year. So that hopefully is a, a chance. We, we did kind of say, oh, could you at least, um, you don't need to cut as often. Could you just cut once a year and things like that? And and there, there are definitely some tricky things like they need different uh, machines if they're going to be cutting less regularly because of uh, yeah. going to be more cuttings. Um, and some things about time commitment because they'll have to collect the cuttings but yeah they definitely are getting better and we're having the conversations mm. um but yeah it's always worth maybe just um sending email to um andrew moulton i think he's the oh, parks yeah. team person, and just saying if there are any key areas mm. that you know know about mm. Mm. That's fantastic. Yeah, well, phil sterling in dorset 
I don't know whether you've heard of him. He did a talk at the Countryside Centre, part of the Verge project, and he's absolutely fantastic. The way he's influenced councils um, and he tells them how they save money in the long run, yeah. because if they pick up the cuttings, of course, you reduce the fertility and you improve it for wildlife. You reduce the, the cost and um, it's a win win. And, and he's done it brilliantly, you know, in Dorset and a few other counties, I think. <laughs> I know we've had a, yeah, the vice mayor had a chat with um, the Torridge Council and they said they were like not using glyphosate and things like that. So it, they are definitely starting to get there, but um, it's just a bit of a slow process sometimes. <laughs> and fantastic. we mentioned oh. two volunteer opportunities, Nicola. What's that, sorry, Mary? Is it okay to mention a couple of potential volunteer opportunities? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, well, these are to do with the Dunescape um, project with, um, you know, Rupert and people on, on the boroughs. And um, one that we're sort of involved with and try, hoping to organise, but the, and we need some interested volunteers that will be sort of shown and... Okay, you know what to do. It's and you know rare protected species, and um, in fact, out um, yesterday and found some early ones sort of um, sunning themselves, mm. but in the four June. So, um, and then one another one which somebody probably else they're looking for someone to organise it will be the Great Crested New um, uh, Project, and but that will be more going out at night, but it'll involve training probably training at the countryside centre maybe or zoom or actually out in the field and um uh so you know if they're interested i suppose either contact rupert or ourselves yeah <laughs> they sound like great opportunities hmm. thank you lovely okay has anyone else got a question for Bryony? That's it then. Okay, well, that's a fantastic. We'll draw the evening to a close. Thank you very much. Um, so just to remind you that Bryony is going to be at the centre next Friday from 10am, 10, 10 isn't it? Or outside the centre so people can come and collect um, the various bits and pieces to help the house martins and the wildflower seeds, which is great. So we will advertise that across Facebook. Um, so I hope you can pop in for that. Um, and then just to let you know, next week, our talk is with Claire Moody, who's the Chief Executive Officer for Plastic Free North Seven. So she's going to be talking about what we can do to help wildlife and reduce plastic. Um, and then we've got a couple more talks after that, which I hope you can join us for. Um, as, and then thank you all for coming and all your contributions. And finally, a big thank you to Bryony for a fantastic evening and so much uh, wealth of information for a sort of follow up on. So if you'd all like to join me in the big virtual round of applause or thumbs up. Thank you very much, Bryony. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great evening.